So we're at session nine of Humanity and Sin. Tonight we're talking about free will and divine sovereignty. Can they be reconciled? So we've got a kind of a review slide from last week. We've got the Pelagian view of free will. On the left is the unfallen. It's possible to not sin. You can choose evil or good, has a moral ability. In the fallen state, it's possible to not sin. And they can choose evil or good based on influences. On the redeemed side, it's possible to not sin. They can choose evil or good, depending on influences. And then, of course, the glorified, it's not possible to sin. They will only choose good. And when we say glorified, that means after the return of Christ. So then we move into an overview of the Armenian free will. And like we talked about earlier, <clears throat> On the unfallen state, it agrees. It's possible to not sin. You can choose evil or good, full moral freedom to do that. Once man is in his fallen state, can choose. It's possible to not sin. Can choose evil, and then it says evil good. The good is going to be tainted with evil. It won't be full evil. It will be good. There will be a goodness. There will be goodness to it. In the redeemed side, of course, it's possible to not sin, can choose evil or good, and the good will be fully good, and the glorified again, not possible to not sin. So then we move into the Augustinian view, and this is in the unfallen state, it's possible to not sin, posse non pocare, meant the ability to choose evil or good. In the fallen state, however, non posse non pocare, not possible to not sin. So every choice is going to be evil if you're unredeemed. It's not possible to do good or to choose good. In the redeemed state, state there's a balance again you have the ability to choose good with god's help or evil and then in the glorified state <clears throat> excuse me it's not possible to sin so as dave pointed out earlier there's a lot of similarities but there are some major differences so then when we take a look at so if does man have free will right so we want to look at um okay <clears throat> excuse me if god foreknows the occurrence of some events which is e does e happen necessarily does something happen because god knows that it will and can it not can it not not happen so let's take a look at some terms that are important in this the first one is theism, from the Greek, Greek word theos, God. This is belief in the existence of an eternal God who freely created all of existence, time, space, matter, celestial realms and bodies, the human race, and all that is in the world, ex nihilo, out of nothing, and who transcends, yet is imminent in the world. Now, for the purposes of our discussion, we understand theism to be the belief that one God exists and that God is personally related to the world, yet separate from the world. And he is separate from the world, independent from the world ontologically or in the essence of his being. So his existence is not contingent on the existence of the universe. Now, we intentionally use this term in order this term in order to, to distinguish it from other models of belief in God. So according to theism, God is an active, 
has an active role and is an active agent in bringing about what he wants from his creation. Now in deism, that, that's a belief that one God exists who's separate from the created world and does not personally relate or interact with the created world called the absentee landlord idea. He started it running and he just left it to its own devices. So he's transcendent, but he's not imminent. Now, panentheism refers to a personal God who's involved with the world, but is not separable or independent from the world. So the universe itself is God, and God is the universe. And then you have pantheism. This is a belief in a world and, a, and a God are all one substance, which consequently eliminates the personhood and independence of God. Now, there are other models of God that we're not going to discuss, but these are the basic views of God. Um, we're going to discount those because they don't fit into our discussion. So when we're talking about theism, that's the model we're interested in because it's the accepted view within Christian orthodoxy. Okay, doesn't matter where you fall. If you're Christian, you believe that God exists and that he is actively in engaged in what goes on with his creation. Okay. Then we have omniscience, omni from all, scientia from true to know or to knowledge. This means having infinite awareness, understanding and insight possessed of universal or complete knowledge. Okay. So when it, in reference to God, God knows all things actual and potential, past, present, and future. And he's never not known all of those things. God's knowledge is categorized as natural knowledge, free knowledge, and middle knowledge. So according to traditional understanding of theism, God is omniscient. And omniscience is a divine attribute of perfectly knowing all propositions that are logically possible to be known. And as we're going to talk about in a few minutes, what qualifies as logically possible to be known is a matter of contention in current scholarship. I'm actually part of a couple of groups online that talk about this quite a bit, quite extensively. Okay, so that's. So now we want to talk about God's knowledge as natural knowledge, okay? So natural knowledge is God's knowledge of all necessary and all possible truths. So in this moment, God knows every possible combination of causes and effects. He also knows all the truths of logic and all moral truths. Um, a triangle has three sides. Well, and A cannot be A and non-A at the same time in the same way at the same place. It's called a brute fact of logic. Now, when we speak of moment, we're referring to logical moments, not chronological moments. So a person doing something is logically prior to God knowing he would do so not chronologically prior. So logical priority means that something serves to explain something else, like a three-sided triangle. Not that it occurs before the other thing. So one provides ground for the other. Like if you take a look at the premises in an argument, all right? Those premises are log logically prior to the conclusion since the conclusion is derived from and based on and flows from the premises, even though the premises and the conclusion are all simultaneously true. So it's a logical order and not a chronological order. Very important distinction to make. So a natural knowledge, God always, God has always known what could happen. 
in any possible circumstance in any possible universe he could create. So natural knowledge is God knowing what could happen in any universe, all right? So now we're gonna talk about free knowledge. This is a knowledge of what God, of, this, this is God's knowledge of what he freely chose to create. God's free knowledge is his knowledge of the actual world as it is. So this knowledge is, it consists of contingent truths that are dependent on God's will, on truths that God brings about that he does not have to bring about. So we, we say like God created the earth, okay? Well, that's something that's particular about this world which God has actualized that are not logical, a logical necessity. God could have created a different world or could have created no world at, at all, right? So when we're talking about free knowledge, we're talking about God has always known what will happen in every possible circuit, circumstance in the actual universe he created. So he always knew what would happen. He knows what uh, uh, will happen. But then we want to talk about middle knowledge. Right in between those two is God's knowledge of what any free creature would do in any given circumstance, also known as counterfactual knowledge. It's sometimes stated as God's knowledge of the truth of subjunctive conditionals. So uh, this is called scientia media, middle knowledge. So these are things that are called, that are independent uh, of God's will. They're truths that do not have to be true, but are true without God being the primary cause of them. If, uh, if I had taken, if I'd flown on a plane instead of driving, I wouldn't have been late for the convention. If I'd taken the train instead of driving, I wouldn't have been late for work. That's an example of middle knowledge. I didn't take, I didn't fly on a plane, I didn't take the train, but God is not, not involved as a cause of that. Um, the train or the plane being a better option is not a logical necessity, so it is contingent if true, depends on other things. So the basic of idea of counterfactual theories of causation is that the meaning of causal claims, this is because of this, that that can be explained in terms of counterfactual conditions. If A had not occurred, C would not have occurred. Okay, there's a phrase called subjunctive conditionals. And we see those in English with verbs in the subjunctive mood like were not, would not, right? Uh, if it were the case that squirrels had no tails, then it would be the case that they easily fall from high places, right? Had not, would not. If I had not, if it had not rained, then the yard would have been dry, right? Those are subjunctive conditionals. So as applies to what we're talking about God's knowledge, God has always known what would happen in every possible circumstance in every, any universe he chose to create. So God knew, knew, always knew everything that could happen in any possible universe. He's always known any, everything that would happen in every circumstance in every possible, in any, every universe he would have created. And then he knows everything that will happen in the universe that he actually created. I hope that is clear. Think of could, would, and will. Okay. Hopefully that'll give you a, a, a good summary. So let's talk about omnipotence. Okay, omnipotence 
all omnipotence, power. Okay. So what this is in reference to is God is omnipotent, able in every respect for every work that is logically possible, unlimited ability, all powerful, almighty. Now, in reference to God, God is able to accomplish all things and act the actual that are consistent with his character. So what this means is that God's ability to do whatever is logically possible for him is known as omnipotence. Now remember the qualification, the qualifier is whatever is logically possible because God can't make a five-sided triangle because tri triangles have three sides. And if it has three sides, it is a triangle. Okay. God cannot create a married bachelor. And he can't create a mother who's, who, he can't create a, someone who's a mother who has never had children. So God is not able to do something that's not logically consistent. He can't create a rock that's too big for him to, to lift, right? Now, there are a lot of passages of scripture that affirm God's ability to act powerfully in marvelous ways. If you look at Jeremiah 32, verse 17, it describes God's power saying, O oh Lord God, behold, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and by your outstretched arm. Nothing is too difficult for you. We hear Jesus say, with men, this is impossible. With God, all things are possible. All things that are logically consistent with his character. There's what we call a conditional, but it's, it's an inferred. It's not a directly stated, right? So then we look at providence, okay? Foresight, providentia. Providence is God's foreknowledge, beneficent care, and governance over the universe at large and human affairs in particular. So the theistic model that we're talking about, God is not disinterested in his creation. He's very interested and very involved. He's concerned and he reveals himself in it. So typically the way God acts in the world to bring about his desired ends is called providence. Now, Christians throughout history and even today hold a variety of views as to how God exercises his providence. Yet all models of divine providence affirm that God is able to use his omniscience and his omnipotence to bring about his providential ends. The parting of the Red Sea, if you will. Right? Now, naturally, this leads to questions concerning the existence of evil, what we call um, um, theodicy. Now, although the problem of evil is fundamentally tied to a person's view of providence, it remains outside the main focus of our discussion. We still need to, to note that our whatever our model of providence is, it will directly shape part of our theodicy, part of our defense of God's goodness and omnipotence in view of the existence of evil. Now, take a look at Psalm 37, 23, and we see the steps of a man are established by the Lord, and he delights in his way. This affirms the idea that divine providence includes personal aspects of individual life. In the New Testament, it says, we know that God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him to those who are called according to his purpose. Divine providence, according to scripture, includes God's ingenious ability to work out what is good for individuals, especially those who love him. If you take a look at Genesis 50, 20, where Joseph tells his brother, you meant evil against me, but God intended it for good. Because of God's providence, he knew what you were going to do, and he had a plan to bring about good as a result of it, to save many even you and your little ones. We see that God's providence is the sustainer of all things. Colossians chapter one says, for by him, all things were created 
both in the heavens and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. So God didn't just simply set the cosmos into, into motion and leave it to run without him. His providence encompasses his own role as the perpetual sustainer of his, all of his creation, including our faith and faithfulness. He's involved in that. Another thing we need to understand is that divine providence is a personal provision and a, co a cosmic sustenance. Okay, so theists also believe God's providence applies to the overall movement of history. Isaiah describes it this way. Declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times, things which have not been done saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. Calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of my purpose from a far country, truly I have spoken, truly I will bring it to pass. I have planned it, surely I will do it, Isaiah 46. So the beginning and the end of the world have been providentially ordained by God. So the providence of God applies to at least three domains, personal guidance, cosmic sustenance and the movement of history to God's desired end. So providence is a big deal. You don't hear it spoken of much, right? So now we wanna talk about sovereignty. This is the right and power to command, to decide, to rule or to judge. This is authority, command, control, domination, dominion, jurisdiction, mastery, might, power, prerogative, and sway. And when it reference to God, God is the supreme ruler of the universe who brings about all things according to his desire. All things according to his desire. Now, that's an interesting word because we see that God does not desire for any to perish, but desires that all would come to repentance. So people say, well, that's a conundrum. That seems like a contradiction. There are other factors that God factors in with his desires, which is what our conversation is about. So the sovereignty of God, so what do we really mean? We mean, we're talking about the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the, the godhood of God, the godness of God. So to say that God is sovereign is to declare that God is God and no one else is. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that all the inhabitants of the earth are regarded as nothing, as Daniel says. He does as he wishes with the army of heaven and with those who inhabit the earth. No one slaps his hand and says to him, what have you done? We see this all throughout scripture where um, um, he's declared that he is the almighty the possessor of all power in heaven and earth so that no one can defeat his counsels, no one can thwart his purpose and no one can really resist his will. Well, if God doesn't desire for any, well, when we talk about his will, what are we talking about? It's part of his will to allow for certain things so that another part of his will will end up being fulfilled. You meant evil against me, but God intended it for good. Was it God's will that his brother sell him into slavery? God didn't say, I want you to do this. God knew that they would. And he, in his will to salvage and save the children of Israel, with a famine that was coming, and to give them an opportunity to build wealth and resources, he needed to get them to Egypt. So in his providence, in his sovereignty, in his, his sovereign will to use the shenanigans and the, the um, scoundrel, the scoundrel tendencies of Joseph's brothers to get him to Egypt, to get them all to Egypt. 
To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he's the governor among the nations, Psalm 22, setting up kingdoms, overthrowing empires, and determining the course of dynasties as pleases him best. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that he is the only monarch, the king of kings, and the Lord of lords, 1 Timothy. So we've seen in our study so far that the Bible affirms God's foreknowledge of future free acts of human beings. Yet there are many who argue that, that such a doctrine really is incoherent. They say the divine foreknowledge and human freedom are mutually exclusive. Their reasoning goes like this. For any future act that you will perform, if some being infallibly believed in the past that that act would occur, there's nothing you can do now about the fact that he believed what he believed since nobody has any control over past events. Also, you cannot make him mistaken in his belief because he's infallible. Therefore, the argument goes, there's nothing you can do now about the fact that he believed in a way that cannot be mistaken that you would do what you will do. And if so, you cannot do otherwise than what he believed you would do. And if you cannot do otherwise, you will not perform the act freely. This is the argument against free will. Now, the most eloquent defender of this position was a philosopher by the name of Nelson Pike. He was uh, an analytical of philosophy of religion, analytical philosophy of religion guru. He passed away a few years ago. So we're going to look at some slides that that break down Pike's argument that if an omniscient God exists, then no human action is truly free. So we're back to the question. If God foreknows the occurrence of some event E, does E happen necessarily? So here's Pike's argument. Okay. Jones, a hypothetical individual, mows his lawn on Saturday afternoons. Since God is omniscient, he knew 80 years ago that Jones would, Jones would mow his lawn on Saturday afternoon. And since God cannot be mistaken, when Saturday afternoon arrives, Jones is not able to refrain from mowing his lawn. God's belief that Jones would mow his lawn is tucked away in the past and cannot be changed. So Jones cannot affect it in any way. Since God's beliefs are infallible, Jones does not have it within his power to do anything other than what God believes he will do. Okay, so we want to look at the following pre premises. Okay, so before, wait, before we get into this, I want to talk about the, the premises that under, underlie, underlie this. So the first premise is that knowledge entails belief. So it's factual, it's factive. So God knows P, a proposition. That also entails that God believes that P will, ex will exist and that P is true. So knowledge entails belief. That's an underlying assumption of his premise. The second one is that God cannot be mistaken, which means he's infallible. So this follows from and is equivalent to the claim that God is essentially omniscient. And what it means is that God believes all truths and believes no falsehoods. So P's truth entails and is entailed by God believes that P. Okay. And the third premise that underlies this is that God has from eternity had foreknowledge of everything that has ever happened. The assumption that God has foreknowledge from eternity can be taken to mean that God exists outside of time, or it can mean to be taken that God exists at all times, depending on your view of time, called the A theory or the B theory. Well, that's not a conversation for today. Pike opted for the latter interpretation. In other words, God exists at all times simultaneously. Okay. So 
any event for any event e god has always known that and when that event has known that event and when that event was going to occur okay so now let's take a look at his argument premise one god's being omniscient necessarily implies in other words it can't be otherwise that if jones mows his lawn on saturday afternoon then God believed in an earlier time that Jones would mow his lawn on Saturday afternoon. Necessarily, all of God's beliefs are true. In other words, none of God's beliefs can be untrue, cannot not be true. Three, no one has the power to make a contradiction true. Four, no one has the power to erase someone's past beliefs. That is to bring it uh, to bring it about that something believed in the past by someone was not believed in the past by that person. So God believed this in the past, and you can't say, "Well, no, actually, God didn't believe that in the past." You can't change the past. Basically, is what it, what it's saying. Premise five: No one has the power to erase someone's existence in the past. That is to bring it about that someone who existed in the past did not exist in the past. Premise six. So if God believed that Jones would mow his lawn on Saturday afternoon, judge can refrain from mowing his lawn only if one of the following alternatives is true. Okay. One, six, one, six, sub one. Jones has the power to make God's belief false. Okay. So the, we're following the logical argument here. Six sub two, if Jones has the power to erase God's past belief, or six sub three, Jones has the power to erase God's past existence. So looking at steps two and three, alternative six sub I is sub one is not possible, is impossible. Alternative two, six sub two is impossible. That's because of step four. And the alternative step three is impossible because of, uh, or alternative three is impossible because of from step five. Therefore, long way to get to the conclusion. If God believes that Mo Jones will mow his lawn on Saturday afternoon, John Jones does not have the power to refrain from mowing his lawn on Saturday afternoon. Jones is not free. Therefore, by extension, if God is omniscient in regard to every person and all that they will be and do, then no person is free with regard to his or her actions. Because steps one and two are simply explication of what it means to be omniscient and therefore are therefore true. Steps four and five are expressions of ways in which our power is limited. So Pike believes that each of these steps are true based on common sense. Step six states in effect, or premise six states in effect, that there are only three alternatives uh, if Jones is to be free. If, so if we could think of a fourth alternative, a, a six sub four, one could escape Pike's argument, but par, Pike apparently thinks that there are only these three. Steps seven, eight, and nine simply eliminate each of these alternatives by appealing to the earlier limitations on power. So then after eliminating those three alternatives, step 10 states the conclusion that if God has foreknowledge, Jones is not, Jones is not free. Um, so this is what we call logical fatalism. The only difference between logical fatalism is theological fatalism, which is just adding God to the equation. And that's the result that we have. Theological fatalism. Theological fatal fatalism says that everything is fated by God. But let's add a fourth alternative. If you take a look at six and you look at three, what if 
the four, there's a fourth alternative, that Jones has the power to act in a different way. And if he were to act in a different way, God would have believed differently. This is what we call logical order. In other words, Jones could have chosen to go golfing on Saturday afternoon instead of mowing his lawn. Now, since God foreknows that Jones will mow his lawn, we know that Jones will in fact mow his lawn rather than go golfing, but it does not follow that Jones must mow his lawn or that he lacks the power to go golfing. He can go golfing, but he merely will not. If he were to go golfing, then God would have foreknown that instead of the other. So just because someone will do something does not necessitate that they must do that thing. And God's infallibility means that whatever Jones will do Saturday afternoon, God foreknows it. So if Jones were to refrain from mowing his lawn, something that is in fact the case now would have been otherwise. So apparently, Pike thought that Jones's power to act differently, as we see from alternative four, meant that Jones has the power to erase God's past belief and to substitute another belief for it. Oops. Sorry. This is actually misunderstanding the alternative. Jones doesn't have the power to erase God's foreknowledge. Well, alternative four simply asserts is that if Jones were to refrain, as he is really able to do, then God would have always foreknown differently. So this is where we introduce what is known, what are known as counterfactuals, okay? Contrary to fact, hypothetical statements. If something were the case, which in fact it is not, then something else would be the case. Jones has the power to refrain, but he simply will not exercise that power since God foreknows what he will do. If he were to refrain, contrary to fact, then what God would have known, foreknown that he would refrain. So let me put it this way. If I had shaved my head this morning, I would be bald right now. That's a true statement, is it not? But it's also a counterfactual. It's contrary to the facts as they are. It's what we call a true counterfactual. And according to even to the Westminster Confession in God's omniscient, God knows only all things that are true, including all true potentialities, all true counterfactuals. Okay. God knows that if I shave my head tomorrow morning, I'll be bald tomorrow afternoon. And God is the only one who knows whether I will actually do that or not. His foreknowledge doesn't determine that it will happen. I'm not fated to do that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the fallacy of fatalism. The argument for theological fatalism commits a fairly common logical fallacy. Premise one, necessarily, if God foreknows X, then X will happen. God foreknows X, therefore X will necessarily happen. Okay. For something to be necessarily so, that means it cannot not be. Okay. So the problem with this is that'd be like reasoning necessarily if Smith is a bachelor, Smith is unmarried. Smith is a bachelor, therefore Smith is necessarily unmarried. But what's wrong with a syllogism? Is Smith necessarily unmarried? No, he simply is unmarried. He has the power to get married. And if he were married, then he would no longer be a bachelor. But from the fact that he is a bachelor, we know with absolute certainty that he is unmarried because by definition, 
the logical order of things. But he's not necessarily unmarried. That is, it's not impossible for him to be married. And when you start putting that word necessarily, you're saying it's impossible for this to be different. But he simply is not married. So what is impossible is that Smith be both unmarried and a bachelor, for this is a logical contradiction. Or be both married and a bachelor. By no stretch of the imagination can we construe Smith's inability to be both a bachelor and married as a limitation on his freedom. He is free to be either one. Well, the same situation holds in the case of the argument concerning God's foreknowledge of anything in our life. Okay. Jones does not mow the lawn because God foreknows that he will mow... God does not mow the lawn because God foreknows that he will not mow the lawn. The fact that he will actually mow the lawn is the reason why God foreknows that Jones will mow the lawn. This does not mean that Jones's action causes God's foreknowledge. It is a logical, not a causal relationship. Like four is an even number because it is divisible by two. It's not causal, it's a logical relationship. That's why it's fallacious to infer that X will necessarily happen. It just will happen. It's entirely possible that X will fail to happen. Of course, it, if it were to fail to happen, God will, would not have foreknown X. So, be, so from the word because expresses a logical relationship of grounding and consequence. So God's foreknowledge is chronologically prior to Jones mowing the lawn, but Jones's mowing the lawn is logically prior to God's foreknowledge. Jones mowing the lawn is the ground, the grounding. God's foreknowledge is a logical, logical consequence. Jones mowing is a reason why God foreknows that Jones will mow the lawn. So one of the first objections most Christians have to this line of reasoning is that if we follow to its logical conclusion, the result is in a, is in a denial of God's omniscience. But it isn't. It's not a denial. Remember, omnipotence. God exists as the greatest of all possible beings. Okay. Sorry. And as such, he is omnipotent, omniscient, and providentially sovereign over all of his creation. These statements about God's attributes being true, therefore, divine foreknowledge and human freedom are not mutually exclusive. Nor does human freedom, divine foreknowledge, yeah, nor does divine foreknowledge constitute theological fatalism, which is the logical end of Augustinian. Calvinism. Right. I got a few more things to say about this. Um, I'm going to bring this back. So, the conclusion naturally follows and demonstrates that theological fatalism is a false thesis. Calvin says, First, the eternal predestination of God by which before the fall of Adam, he decreed what should took place, take place concerning the whole human race and every individual was fixed and determined. He also says, there are some also who allege that God is greatly dishonored of such arbitrary power is bestowed on him but does their distaste make them better theologians than paul who has laid it down as a rule of humility for the believers that they should look up to the sovereignty of god and not evaluate it by their own judgment let me tell you what the problem with our our god being arbitrary arbitrary by definition means made without any knowledge but god cannot know something that is that is true cannot know cannot not know something that is true. God cannot be arbitrary. 
So to say that God is, has arbitrary power contradicts God's omniscience. So that's not God. That is not the God of the Bible. It's logically and theologically indefensible. I heard John MacArthur say it this way. All of mankind stands with his back, their back to God, and God goes through and chooses whom he will to be saved. Not based on anything that he knows. That contradicts the tenets of the omniscience of God. Because that means God is arbitrary, but he can't be arbitrary because arbitrary means make a decision based, make a choice based on not, on no knowledge. See how it's logically incoherent? You can't get there from here. Okay. Everything is controlled by God's secret purpose and nothing can happen except by his knowledge and will. That's Calvin. He also wrote this. The reason why God elects some and rejects others is to be found in his purpose alone. Before men are bor born, their lot is assigned to each of them by the secret will of God. The salvation or the destruction of men depends on his free election. Okay, there's lots and lots and lots and lots and lots. Here, he says, here he runs full sail against God for determining some from the very creation to destruction. That's Calvin in his concerning the eternal predestination of God. A few pages earlier in that same work, he says, the secret counsel of God whereby he chooses some to salvation and destines others for eternal destruction. God has chosen to salvation those whom he pleased and has rejected the others without without our knowing why, except that its reason is hidden in his eternal counsel. Lots and lots and lots and lots of things like this. R.C. Sproul makes a comment on this where he says, this statement refers to God's eternal and immutable decretive will. It's his, his discretion. It applies to everything that happens. Does this mean that everything that happens is the will of God? Yes. So it's God's will that that woman is gang raped when she goes to that party when she's in college. Anybody have a problem with that? God wills that to happen. There's, I just have lots and lots and lots of quotes from this. So how do we reconcile these things? Outside of creation, no creation exists. God has always known every possible universe he could create out of an infinite number and variety of universes infinite number and variety of free creatures he could create in an infinite number and variety of universes and the infinite number and variety of circumstances those creatures could be placed in in every possible choice they could make of all those possibilities since god is not willing that any would perish but that all would come to repentance. And that God would not create a universe that would not accomplish his optimum best will. The universe that God sovereignly chose to create is the universe in which every human being who could come into existence who given the grace to understand the gospel and to say yes to the gospel would come into existence and will say yes to the gospel. In other words, no one 
will be lost in this universe who would have been saved in another universe. Nothing arbitrary about any of that. It takes into consideration God's omniscience, his omnipotence, his providence, and his sovereignty. It also takes in all the other attributes. What it does not do is draw from the universalism of um, Plato. that is woven into Augustinianism. It does not lay hold of that. It does not exalt God's sovereignty above every other attribute, which is what Calvinism does. If God is more sovereign than he is ever anything else, he's not the God of the Bible. Because each of God's attributes are infinite in their expanse. And all of his attributes are infinitely balanced. He's not, he's not more sovereign than he is just, than he is good, than he is loving, than he... Do you see what, I'm, what happens? It, however, if you take God's sovereignty and make it at the top of all of his attributes you end up with theistic fatalism. You end up with Augustinian Calvinism, logically. So that'll give you something to ponder for a little while. But let me talk to you a little bit about the difference between roses and tulips, okay? Um, previous uh, cohorts had a different book than Nancy Piercy's Love Thy Body. They had uh, Kenneth Keithley's Salvation and Sovereignty. Um, but instead of total depravity, we look at radical depravity. Radical depravity says every aspect of our being is affected by the fall and renders us incapable of saving ourselves or even wanting to be saved. That stands in lieu of total depravity because the Imago Dei is still maintained and the um, communicable attributes of God that he created us with are still in place defective, but still there. Instead of irresistible grace, this view holds to overcoming grace. So it's God persistent beckoning, never really giving up, that eventually overcomes our wicked obstinacy. Every individual is subject to this grace. And only who those who God in his sovereignty has created to allow themselves to be overcome by their own free choice will do so. Then you have what is called sovereign election, okay? So God desires a salvation all, yet, yet accentuates that our salvation is not based on us choosing God, but God choosing us. He chose us knowing that given the chance to say yes, we would say yes under the right conditions. There are some people who would say no, no matter what, like Pharaoh. So this is a, a viable option as opposed to unconditional election. God decreed to actualize this world in which he knew all those who would freely say yes to him if given the chance, given the ability. And in so doing, he elected not to actualize an alternative world in which we would not freely choose him. 
then instead of perseverance of the saints, the view is eternal life. Believers enjoy a transformed life that is preserved, and we are given a faith which will remain as we continue continuing, as Paul says in Philippians. And then singular redemption. So Christ died sufficiently for every person, although it's efficient only for those who believe. This instead of the deterministic option of limited atonement. The blood of Christ was shed for all of humanity. We see that in several places in scripture. It serves as pardon for the believer who has Christ's righteousness imputed to them. And for the unbeliever, it serves as an indictment because they've refused. Okay. So that's the difference between roses and tulips. Hey, Warren. So, thoughts, questions? Yeah, go ahead, Carl. Um, I'm, does everyone know what the acronyms are and how they came about? We haven't gotten into that. That's soteriology class. Okay. If you want to explain it, you can. No, I mean, the, two, the, the acronym for TULIP are the five or six tenets of five. Calvinism, five, five tenets of Calvinism. It just mean, it just, it's just a, a way to remember what, <clears throat> what the tenets of Calvinism are. Roses is in response to that. So, yeah, if that's helpful. Yeah. yeah. And you have to remember that when they came up with the tulip, it was a denouncement of Arminianism, but there were no Arminians at this, at that council to be part of the conversation about what Arminians actually believed. But it's kind of how the thing they rolled in those days. So have I completely messed with your mind? Well, since everybody's quiet, I'm going to stop the recording and we'll call it good.